environmental psychology began in the late 60s um, because really there hadn't been any um, response from the field of psychology before to the need that architects had and others, other environmental groups like geographers and environmental managers of all kinds to um, the questions of human behavior in the environment. And so environmental psychology from the beginning was asked to um, address the question of how people perceived and behaved in relationship to the physical environment. We're commonly asked by architects as well as by the popular press, how does the physical environment impact or directly influence uh, human behavior? And of course, there are some ways that it does, but it's a more complicated story than that. Um, and a richer story and more interesting story than that because we in turn impact the environment. Um, we have to um, try to get away from the simple-minded idea that's, that space is somehow separate from people. We tend to talk about the physical environment as though it was a container and then we're in this container and so then we ask simple questions like how does the container influence us? as though it's separate from us. A more useful way to think about it for architects is how do the settings they create afford a range of opportunities for people? Well, we use this term affordance quite a lot because it's not deterministic. It recognizes that people uh, have a range of responses to the influences on them. But those range of responses can be narrowed dramatically by bad design. And one of the things that architects and landscape architects and anybody involved in design really needs to be doing is trying to um, enable people to achieve in their lives what they need to achieve. For example, to think of, of childcare and schools. If you look at very young children, um, the physical environment that they spend time in in a childcare center, say, or in a preschool, enables them in different degrees to do what they want to try to do. And young children are trying to play. Well, if young children are in a monotonous room that is homogeneous with a single surface and has no storage, then the range of play that they can engage in is limited. If those same children are in another room that has carpeting, storage, little cubbies and, and is differentiated into smaller spaces, the range of things they can, go, they can do increases enormously. So much so that research that's been done in this kind of setting shows that when you differentiate the space just a little bit, children engage in the same activities for longer periods, they are more deeply engaged, there's more social interaction between them. So actually, um, simply that by breaking the space up, you get richer play opportunity and, and better qualities of social interaction. Well, architects seem to be most uh, comfortable and clear when they're talking about um, buildings that, they're, that people are not supposed to touch. You know, they're supposed to be just looked at that's when they're really at their happiest and clearest. And I've attended many of those kinds of lectures. Um, when you think about what the business is of making a home uh, that people have done for generations and generations before architects came along, um, they did it with a whole wealth of knowledge that was not narrowly about structure. It was all about um, the qualities that they were trying to create for a rich, full life. So it's ridiculous to think that one profession could just come in and do that by itself without a team approach. I suppose the reason architecture in the United States um, was much more open to the participation of the client in the design process and to recognizing the importance of a range of disciplines in the training of architects. It was all part of the opening up of the 1960s and 70s. The zeitgeist of the time was about um, 
really being more participatory and um, being more inclusive. The death of that in the late 70s, I've never fully understood why architecture abandoned so completely um, that rich period. Um, and returned to something which was narrowly about the technical side of architecture, plus a part of the human engagement which is appealing to architects, which is the aesthetic part and the symbolic. So, you know, after the mid 70s or late 70s, architects now start just talking about um, the meaning of architecture to people, as though they can somehow Im impose meaning on people. Um, and, and how places are perceived in terms of their visual properties. Much like they're talking about a piece of art or a museum. Um, the idea that people would be moving and struggling to use these buildings is uninteresting to them. And one only has to look at all the architecture magazines to see there's no discussion of any of that. They're all uh, empty of human behavior. They are, the photographs are taken um, usually before people have had the chance to move in and mess up these beautiful objects that they create. And so, I, you know, it, it's not a social profession. Um, it really is um, a profession of, of artists who are removed from their social responsibility. Of course, there are exceptions. Uh, architects who try to work in a participatory way, and there's one or two architecture schools that try to encourage that. Um, I work a lot in, in the third world or the majority world, whatever you want to call it, and there, uh, of course, the, the arrogance of architecture is harder to uphold because um, of the dire situation. So many people build their own homes, and participatory uh, design is more uh, common because it's a necessity. And, and I, I get to see the benefits of that. I get to see people meaningfully engaged in creating their own spaces um, that are close to, to their needs. But of course, they're not doing it with the same resources that we, we have here. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we could find a way to do participatory housing design, for example, in this country, um, where people are allowed to at least finish off the buildings our graduate students and uh, some of us on the faculty do get asked to do architectural programming and sometimes design evaluation. So that does happen, especially in complex environments where architects are willing to admit that they have to get help. For example, we're involved a lot in children's hospital design where um, it's obvious that external expertise is needed. Here's a very real case study. Uh, last year in New York, um, New York City government was uh, defending itself in a lawsuit brought by nonprofit groups working on homelessness who wanted to open up single room occupancy housing, which is, this, which is the kind of housing that was created for single men after the war when there was a big housing shortage. We have lots of this housing still left in New York City and um, families are not allowed to be in it. And uh, these uh, homeless organizations, coming from a good perspective, obviously, trying to create a solution to the housing problem, said we should allow children, families with children, into these single room occupancy houses. And, and, and I supported the city government and went on the side of trying to prevent this from happening. Fortunately, we won the case. But let me tell you what was important data for that. The important data for it was, number one in my mind, we know that if you have more than one person per room on average, the stress levels are damaging. We now have good reason to believe that they even damage the brain. So if you have a high stress level like that in the first few years of life, you will actually affect the brain. So if anybody wants to find out why it is that the poor remain poor, and why educational levels of the poor are as they are. We know that lead affects the brain, so finally we've got rid of lead. But architects need to know, and the people who design, it's less architects, more the people who hire architects to build environments, that you cannot afford to have density levels of more than one person per room because you will have stress effects that affect the brain and development. That's strong data.